Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 182nd video cast, 172nd podcast for the week ending April 13th, 2023. Hope everyone had a nice Easter or holiday, whatever you celebrate. Uh, we did this egg hunt in the front yard. I think Caitlin paid a bunch of college kids to spread out a hundred or a couple hundred of these eggs all over the property, so uh, the girls were happy. And we're trying to milk it here. I think they're getting towards the top end of Easter egg hunts, but hopefully we'll squeeze a couple years out, or at least they'll play along to get candy. Uh, and that's them, a little bit further view. Uh, and then here's with the dogs, uh, Lucky and Pepper. Uh, these dogs are very attractive and both dumb as rocks, but nonetheless, uh, we love them. Here's little Lucky. Here's little Pepper, and uh, and they're great. And then we went to brunch, and uh, as we do every year, and that was just a wonderful time. That's Caitlin and myself. And then our quote of the week. So this is from David Tepper, one of the all-time legends. Uh, he said, we keep our cool when others don't. The point is, markets adapt, people adapt. Don't listen to all the crap out there. David Tepper. <laughs> we couldn't agree more. Uh, this here chart where is, um, is seasonality during pre-election year and aggregate cycle seasonal pattern from 1942 to uh, 2022. This is from Jeff Hirsch over at Almanac Trader, the Stock Traders Almanac. Those of you in the business, you, you know that's been around for a long time. And his father, Yale, started it. I had a chance to, uh, to meet Jeff at the Money Show in New York a, a number of weeks ago when I spoke there. Uh, so this shows all pre-election years in blue. So you can see the strength in the April seasonality. Uh, the purple one here is 2023. So it's kind of holding right alongside the, the standard uh, pre-election cycle for sure. This is interesting, though. The green line, which is the best performance, is when you have a pre-election year after a midterm bear market, which was last year. And uh, and it looks like here we're playing catch up. And as I generally said, uh, with all the cash and all the bonds, I think we're going to get this rally into the summer. Everyone's going to get caught off sides. And when they finally force in that cash will be when the market makes no returns for five or six months. So I think we've got some you know, number, maybe a couple of months here to jam up higher, uh, get everyone in, and then that'll basically be it. Uh, we talked about an analog of 1966, and then Ken Fisher was out uh, in recent weeks talking about the summer of love in 1967, great minds think alike. Um, and But he went into some more detail that I think is very helpful. I was just looking at the chart analogs based on certain conditions that we look at. Uh, but... Um, he said, uh, this was in uh, mid-January when he came out, and we were talking about it in October. Um, he said, inflation is deader than a doornail. Markets just don't know it yet. We've been talking about the same thing with owner's equivalent rent being such a heavy weight in the CPI component. We're going to talk about that. And he said, first, to see it, you have to see that 2022, almost anything you say about it could be almost perfectly the same way as 1966 or just slightly differently. Rate hikes, explosive inflation out of nowhere, big regional war, the most divisive era in U.S. politics. You could go recession expectations, anticipation of capitulation at bear market. That was the same magnitude, started almost the same day in January and almost the same day in October. The fourth quarter rally, almost exactly the same size, strong start to 1967 like we're having now. And in reality, from all that, 1967 is the year when inflation peaks and falls and interest rates plateau. We don't get the recession because widely anticipated recessions are met by mitigation and anticipation. It's the most parallel period in modern history. So I think that's huge. But let's just take a look at the charts that we showed you last year. This was 1967. And we were pointing to this bottom and comparing it in October. Well, take a look what's happened. Uh, gosh, I wish I could do these side by side. Oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, let me just pull this one up somehow. Okay, that's the CPI print. By the way, you can see CPI completely rolling over. I don't know if the Fed needs a magnifying glass, but uh, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But let me get this comparable chart up 
here we go. All right, so. Okay, so you can see here in the 1966, uh, you had that bottom in October, and it was off this huge rally, just like we had off of COVID. Monster correction, it looked like about uh, 27, 25, 27%. And then you get this initial rally followed by some consolidation. No one believes you're gonna go back to new highs. And look at where we are now. So we got this huge October uh, double below met by this consolidation. No one believes you're going to make new highs. And I think we're going to break out to new highs. And and it sounds crazy. It's like, how can you do that? Earnings are going down to 200, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can't say this enough, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Just look at history. The market bottoms six to 12 months before earnings bottom. We said last year on public TV, uh, they said, well, how do you think next year is going to be? I think the And I said, I think the economy is going to be a little bit worse. And I think the stock market's going to be a little bit better. And how could you make such a divergent point of view is because the market priced in all the bad news that we're hearing today, six months ago in October, and the market is going to start to price in all the good news, meaning record earnings in 2024, uh, in the next couple of months as we get uh, closer to six months before 2024. So um, this is playing out in the exact same way where you have this chop where no one believes it and then all of a sudden there's a catalyst to the upside. What's going to this catalyst going to be? My guess it's going to be something fed related. You know, maybe they 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 make the mistake and do one more but they definitively say pause or maybe if they actually just pause and they take a look at the inflation numbers and uh and some of the things we're going to talk about today. Um I <laughs> I do I can see on LinkedIn where I publish on LinkedIn, the companies that read my note. And, um, you know, th there are some pretty serious uh, groups of people that read my note. Uh, so, you know, this message is not falling on deaf ears it is my general uh, uh, outlook. And it's not unique. I mean, I think there are other people that are looking at that are data driven that are saying similar things. Uh, and uh, hopefully it'll be heard. And, and uh, you could have this type of situation where everyone is in cash and bonds. And we've said over and over, Markets do not top when everyone is overweight cash and bonds. Why? Because if you were, what everyone's waiting for is not going to happen. If it was that easy where everyone could be in cash, then the market could correct back to the below the October lows, which like 90% of pessimistic uh, strategists are calling for because they're focused on 2023 earnings, which have already been priced in 2022 versus 2024 earnings. Uh, which actually could be low if China does what I think they're going to do in terms of uh, booing the global growth and, and even S&P earnings when you think about Nike and Starbucks and many companies selling to China. So, so this is where we are, ladies and gentlemen, and no one believes it. Everyone's in cash. So you're not going to get a situation where the market's going to give you a chance to take that cash and buy at October lows. What more likely is going to happen is the market's going to press higher and press higher. No one's going to believe it. All these strategists are going to keep coming on and say, these multiples are out of control. But I've been saying since October, markets don't bottom on low multiples. They bottom on very high multiples because you have trough earnings. You have to look out the rear. You have to look out the windshield, not through the rear view mirror. And all these folks are, are looking through the rear view mirror or more likely looking through the side windows, and which is going to crash them into a pole. They need to be focused on the windshield and looking out at 2024 not at 2023 or at 2022 and making multiples on that basis. So here we are, here we are, you know, you got the rally now, now the indecision and the maximum pain based on the amount of cash and bonds and everyone's saying, oh, short term treasuries is such a smart trade. Well, it is a smart trade unless equities go up 20% and you miss it and you're stuck with your 4% locked in in cash and, um, and you miss the whole thing and, and you miss a 20% move and some of the stocks are up 40, 50%. It's very, very hard to ever, ma ever make that up over the long term. So, um, so that's that. I could stop right there. That's the most important thing I'm going to say. But um, uh, I would say stay tuned because I often think that's the most important thing I'm going to say. And then something just comes out of stream of consciousness. We've got a lot here to cover today. Uh, moving along, this is, the, this is from Renmac. Uh, Renaissance Macro, 
you can check them out or Google them. I think that's Jeff DeGraff shop. But um, here he's talking about the S&P total return based on year on year money supply. And everyone's a little worried and, and reasonably so that money supply is actually M2 uh, growth is negative And what happens. And he's pointed out that um, on average, that's actually a bottom uh, when money supply can contracts is the low and you see these rallies come like you saw in 2011 multi-year rally uh, and all these red areas the, mar the rally kept going in mid 90s when everyone was concerned uh, and and back and back and back so his data points to that's actually not necessarily a bad th thing in the short term uh, don't need to re-emphasize investors piling into cash like they did at the pandemic lows like they did at the great financial crisis lows. The market doesn't go lower to allow those people to buy into stocks at lower levels. What it does is it takes off without them and they wind up chasing at new highs and that's when the market finally gives them the pullback they've been waiting for right after they buy the top. Just like we saw with Alibaba at 120, pulled back, takes them all out and then they won't catch it again until it's at 160 and some of them will make the same exact mistake. Um, Next thing here, this is from Jay Capel over at um, Sentiment Trader, at J-A-Y-K-A-E-P-P-E-L. Uh, and he's talking about 20-day average crosses below uh, 10 and what that means in terms of data moving forward. On average, six months later, the s and is up 9%. Uh, I'm sorry, on average, the median is 9%, on average up 8%, and one year later up on average 16%, with the median being 20.14. These are just tidbits. These are, we, we look at hundreds of data points. We don't rely on any one indicator, but uh, all these things are say, singing the same song, which is, which is when we get interested. And we've been talking about these since October of last year, and even in June, which wasn't much. Uh, higher than the October lows. Um, <clears throat> so here you have insider buying. People believe that when that abates uh, from a peak, that's bearish. But heavy insider buying, I'm reading Jay's quote here, it's outside the, the box. Uh, heavy insider buying typically pays off over one to three years. That's correct. So when, because they can't dodge in and they can't day trade their company stocks they got to buy it when it's really low and hold it for a couple years and they do that for taxes and they also do it because they don't want to have to report because when they sell people think it means something bad about the company etc so when buying abates it's often when the party is just getting started we agree and what happens here is six months later uh the average returns are 12% for the S&P, one year later, 23%. So they're all pointing to the same type of situation. And you can see the red dots, and, and uh, that's, a, that's a positive thing. Here's from Carl Quintanilla. This is very important with rates going up now. Uh, this is from J.P. Morgan. Sembolist is the name of the analyst. Uh, many U.S. and global companies termed out their fixed rate debt and have the lowest interest expense to cash flow in decades. Let me say that again. So, look. If you didn't get your refinancing done in the last few years, shame on you. Um, but for, for the vast majority of companies, they have, in which case um, you've got a situation where um, lowest interest expense to cash flow in decades. It's the same thing when everyone keeps saying, look, the consumer credit cards are going through the roof. But when you look at debt service, to disposable income because everyone refis it at low rates we're at near historic lows going back 50 plus years and we've covered that in past podcasts so some may not feel a material impact from the rising interest rates until 2030 now do you think rates are going to be higher or lower by 2030 all you need to do is look at the 10-year yield uh and you're seeing it at three and change and that that tells you everything you need to know so they'll be able, well able to refinance well before that moving along austin goolsby Never thought I'd be on the same page. I mean, this is the this is this is the year of George Costanza. You know, the, the people that I most agree with, uh, my goodness, was Elizabeth Warren on her views on the Fed and Jay Powell, and now Austin Goolsby out saying the Fed should be careful about hiking too aggressively. So, um, you know, at least the good message is you understand that uh, I'm an ideas guy, not a personality guy or a political guy. Good ideas 
are good ideas uh, all around. And, um, and it's great to see Goolsby now on the Fed being a voice of reason and practical balance to, to hopefully offset some of these you know, wild hawks on autopilot. Uh, and um, I was talking to a reporter from Barron's today, and uh, and he was saying that uh, he said that key word autopilot, and we were ta- and he nailed it. And we were talking about 2018, the first time Powell um, really screwed up at, when he said he was going to keep quantitative uh, tightening on autopilot, and the market crashed 20 percent in the month of December. And if if uh, Mnuchin had not been there as Treasury Secretary, it could have been like completely off the cliff depression, but Mnuchin knows what he's doing. He called all the banks together on Sunday night, uh, Christmas Eve, I think it was, uh, and uh, they fixed it. Powell had to go out publicly in the next few days and reverse his position. And, uh, you know, it's something like that, and you get these massive, massive turnarounds. Now from Ryan Dietrich, more than 93% of stocks were recently above their 10-day moving average. This is another strong sign of market breadth. And one that tends to resolve higher eventually. Up a year later, 23 out of 24 times, and up on average, 18.4%. So all of these are right in the neighborhood. All of these triggers are right in the neighborhood of 20% up, and no one's positioned for that. And that's what the market is going to do to cause maximum pain for the most amount of people at any one point in time. We've covered that many times, and and this time will be no different. Um, Here is from Urban Carmel. In the five of the past six rate cycles, a recession did not follow within a year of the last hike, all the lines above zero. The one exception is the line below zero, which is the one exception that everyone's citing, and it's the exception, not the rule. On balance, when they stop hiking, markets go up, and they go up a lot, and you can see here around that 15 to 20 uh, range is probably the average 12 months out. Uh, Seth Golden, um, this is uh, via Seth Golden. This is from, I think, JP Morgan. Shelter inflation has now started to roll over following sharp deceleration in home prices and rents over the past year. Shelter's contribution to CPI inflation should retreat as the year uh, progresses. And uh, we agree. That's what we've been saying. And you're going to see it show up bigly in May, June, and July. And we've been saying that since November, December, January. Watch what happens in May, June, and July. It's already starting to happen a little bit here in April. But uh, I think we're going to see these prints Here's uh, also from Seth via Yardeni. Uh, Year-on-year rent inflation decelerated to the greatest degree in the current cycle in March of 2023, anticipating continuation and greater impact on overall CPI in the months ahead as the lag data materialize in a monthly CPI. Got, ladies and gentlemen, it's not complicated. Leases last, residential leases last 12 months. That's all you need to know. 12 months ago was the peak. This is a material deterioration and it's going to show up in spades uh, in the next few months uh, as, as we see moving forward. So moving right along, uh, let's go through a bunch of charts here, uh, some indicators. This put call continues to come down, and that's what you see when, ahead of multi-year rallies like 2020, like 15, 16, like 11, 12, and so on and so forth. Um, let's take a look. This, this uh, We continue to pound on this every week because it's just like 11 and 12, and it's just like 15, 16 is the uh, NASDAQ 1% exponential moving average of advanced decline ratio. It's chopping up around here, finding its bottom, and that usually precedes multi-year rallies again. Um, NASDAQ cumulative volume ratio, again, you get these spikes and then follow through. Uh, Here is the NASDAQ Cohen high low, uh, spikes down at the bottom, spike down at the bottom, and then starts to work its way higher with the rallies. So again, these are just you know, one, two, three of, of hundreds of things that we look at, but when they all point to the same thing, you got to pay, pay the hell attention. It's just like in October when we were saying, uh, if you're not buying stocks at, at these levels with these indicators, with this level of sentiment, find another business. Like, it's, you're just not cut out for this. Like, if we're not buying here, I, my quote was, if we're not buying here, what the hell are we doing? And sure enough, you know, within days, that was the low. And we've been rallying since. Now we're doing that chop like you saw in the 66 analog, like you see out of pretty much every uh, major dislocation. And that's our knitting is is profiting from periods of dislocation. Here's the real estate. You can't give these things away. We covered Vernado in spades last week. By the way, if you go to Vernado, you know, we talked about best properties in the best city in the world. 
Fifth Ave, Park Avenue, Madison Avenue. If the band is done with those, then you got a lot more to worry about than Steve Roth. But um, uh, we we really like that position, so it's going to be a choppy one for a few weeks or months. But when this when it goes, in the meantime, we're going to get paid ten percent. If they cut the dividend in half again, which is unlikely because they just cut in January, we'll still get paid five percent while we wait. We'll deal with the short term price swings. We don't care. And two three years out, we'll be up on a triple with that and got paid in the meantime. I mean, it's just you know, it's not genius here. I've just, you know, lived and, and worked through enough crisis, crises that I know how this works. When you're in periods of dislocation, you buy the highest quality in the most hated groups and you make tons of money. That's just the, that's just the name of the game. So uh, I don't need to say it many more times, but uh, we love dislocation. Sector, company, country, all of it, we love it. So uh, National Association of Active Investment Managers, 60% uh, equity exposure. So again, they're not overweight. They're going to have to chase up if we get another 1967. And there's also, I think 53 was another analog we put out in the fall, but uh, maybe we'll cover that next week. Um, but all these things, you know, maybe a little bit stretched uh, for some of the non-NASDAQ ones in the short term, but it's not, not a big issue. We're coming into earnings. We'll see what banks do. Uh, here's the NASDAQ again. All the NASDAQ ones are saying, hey, it's basically time to be a buyer, not a seller. And um, and that's where we've been focused. So here's the skew again, favorable outcome. If it gets up here, we want to be a little leery because people are placing one and two standard deviation bets on, you know, kind of cat insurance. Uh, that's when we'd be more concerned. We're nowhere near those levels. Uh, and the VIX continues to trend down. I think it hit 17 today which everyone says is cheap, it's not even close. We're going to get that back down to 12 to 10, and that's when everyone's going to be shocked, and uh, and no one's going to want to buy insurance, and that's when we're going to load up, by the way. So, um, i.e. puts, you know, uh, we, we do know that there are times to get bearish. So, uh, here's sector by sector. Uh, communication services starting to come out. We talked about that before the end of the year. Discretionary and communication services were the worst. They were going to be the best. Here's tech. There's still opportunity. This is times you want to buy, not sell. 2011, 2016, 2020. You know, ladies and gentlemen, this is not rocket science. You just got to have some uh, cojones and uh, and know what you're doing. I mean, that's that's really what it comes. These things repeat over and over. Financials. I still won't buy regionals. I think some of them are going to be okay. You know, uh, some of the higher quality regionals, but they they haven't come out down enough for the risk reward. That's why I just like Bank of America. Honestly, the play, if you want to get, look, I think this is the play. If you want to get rich on regional banks being dislocated, I wouldn't buy the regional banks uh, because you don't know which one's going to blow up or whatever. And, and if they keep hiking, you know, they're going to blow up randomly and it's going to be one you're not looking at. You know, everyone's looking at First Republic, Pacific West, etc. cetera. Uh, it's going to be one you don't expect. And, um... I don't want to play that game. But the way to play it is to buy the small cap index because it's loaded with regional banks. You, you you could say, well, why not just buy the KRE, the small the regional uh, banking ETF? Be, because you can have your cake and eat it too. You can be hedged against bad, more bad things happening in regional banks and get massive upside if good things start happening in regional banks. Uh, and and so on. And we just like small caps generally in terms of relative valuation, etc. So uh, that's the way to play it, is uh, buying the small cap index. Uh, and in our case, we bought Bank of America in March, uh, which we like. It came down enough relative to the regionals without the regional risk. Actually, they'll benefit from the regionals pain. Uh, and, you know, uh, but but in fairness, the real way to play it Forget small caps. Forget Bank of America. Honestly, the real way to play it is Vernado, in, in my humble opinion. Not to say Vernado can't be a donut hole, and it's it's sized accordingly. But um, if Vernado's a donut hole, we got a lot more to worry about in terms of the general market. And, and with the general market and earnings and the economy, I'm generally bullish. The Fed could mess it up if they go two more hikes. They're getting right, right to the edge. Uh, I, I don't think they will. I think the data is now starting to give them enough cover that they can say, look, we're going to pause. We intend to, to re-raise once we see, and then they just never re redo it. 
uh, they just pause and they stay elevated. And the beauty for them is if they actually pause now, they'll be able to keep rates elevated for a long period of time. If they do that extra one or two, which is stupid, uh, there's no other way to put it, they're going to wind up having to cut 100 basis points, do bailouts, break things, uh, and not keep it rates elevated, which means in theory, inflation could re reaccelerate. And, and it's just being impatient. Pause, wait. If you have to raise more, raise more. If you don't, by the way, why not sell a few hundred billion dollars of bonds and leave rates alone and start using 2023 tools for 2023 problems versus 1970 tools, blunt instruments, when you all you had was rates. Now we've got a record $9 trillion balance sheet. Sell out. You want to drain liquidity? Sell a few hundred billion dollars of bonds and keep rates exactly where they are. They should have done that 100 basis points and kept rates at three and a half or four, uh, and and had the balance sheet at six six trillion versus nine trillion. So we've got some bullets for the next time. So financials, there's th there's things to do here, and some people make money with the regionals. But I, I tell you the way, the best ways I think to play that I've laid out um, some healthcare action opportunity. You know, some of these. Here we go, industrials. So we've got 3M for that. We've talked about that in recent weeks. Uh, materials, not much exposure there. There might be something to look at, but I'm not in love. I, I don't like those highly cyclical. I like the durable ones that are dislocated. Um, but I'll take a look and see if there's something to do in materials. Real estate, we've covered. It's, time. it's, it's go time, ladies and gentlemen. Um, all right. Telecom, that's basically two stocks, and utilities, there's some beaten down there that you can make a trade on, so that's pretty cool. Moving on, NASDAQ, let's just take a look at what's happening. No, you couldn't give away tech in December when we were pounding the table. Look, look at this, ladies and gentlemen. Here's Apple, here's Adobe, and by the way, some of them haven't even started, and, and they're, they're going to be continued opportunity. ADP, I think, is interesting here. Uh, they're pricing a massive amount of job losses, but um, don't forget, they make the float on all that cash that they hold for two weeks between pay periods, and they're getting 4 or 5% on it. So this one's really interesting, to be honest with you. Um, Amgen has started to move, which we talked about on one of the shows a few weeks ago. It's, it's big weight in the biotech, which is very important. Uh, Amazon is, is starting to move here, and, and we were talking about that in the fall. Uh, rip rallied after we started talking about it pulled back now it's starting to go and jassy was on tv today talking about all the ai and the stuff with the cloud which is basically a mirror story for what's going to happen with um uh, alibaba uh, ali yun ali cloud at a much faster scale because they're doing the ai uh, within their products um Biogen, all these biotechs are starting to move now, which is good because that's been kind of dead money. They bottomed in May and it's just grinded side, you know, ripped higher. Very exciting. Then it just grinded sideways, just had a recent pullback to shake out all the all the doubters. And now it's starting to move again, which is exciting. Uh, that's a nice wait for us. Charter, these, these, you know, we're looking at, we haven't done anything with them. Um... I think there's another one, Cable One, that looks like that. But, you know, there's op there's things to do, you know. So we hear all these analysts, stocks are too high, blah, blah, blah. Um, which ones? Tell me which ones. Stop, stop talking in the aggregate. Google is moving. We own that. Uh, Google and Amazon are our two fangs that we've talked about in the last couple of months. Uh, Intel, this baby is moving. We're excited about that. That's a nice position for us. Uh, what else? Uh, so some of these have moved, like the staples have moved a lot. I, I wouldn't be a buyer of Mondelez up here. Uh, Microsoft, what a move. Uh, even Netflix. NVIDIA, I don't think I'd be a buyer up here. I like the Intel anyway. I think that's going to work higher over the next couple of years. Uh, Pep, Pepsi just always works. People love those snacks, I'll tell you. Uh, PayPal we own. Okay, so this one I think is just getting started. I think that's going to be a great trade. Um, investment. I, I hope this one is a two or three year position. I think that's got a lot of opportunity. Oh, come on. Let's see here. So I'm just giving you an idea here.
just so you sometimes it really helps to go through all this stuff so you can just mentally adjust because there's so much negativity out there and, and all these things are going up and no one wants to own them. No one wanted to own tech all year. Uh, Qualcomm might be worth a look. I mean, we have Intel. So Starbucks is breaking out. Why? Because of China. Uh, what else is here? Walgreens boots. No one wants that. That one's starting to go. I think that's kind of interesting. We don't have any of that. All right, sectors. Let's go through this. Small caps to S uh, and P 500. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what I'm talking about. When it gets these spike down, it's time to buy, and I think that's going to be the regional play story. That's the way to play the regional banks. Uh, if you don't have the cojones for something like uh, Vornado, which I don't blame you if you don't, but I've done the work on it and I feel very comfortable with the position, but. Obviously, if I was super comfortable, it would be a 20% position, but, you know, you have to risk adjust and manage the size accordingly. REITs, I love it, love it, love it. This is the same type of setup as small caps, you know. It's underperformed and then it takes off. Transports, this is interesting. It's kind of looking similar. So you saw FedEx start to take off. We were looking at that. Um, some of the airlines are left for dead. There might be some opportunities starting to pick up there. Uh Tech, remember, no one wanted it down here. It's broken out. It's just starting to work higher. It's going to work to new highs on a relative basis. Uh, bonds are starting to come back to life. Home builders had a run. They're, they're taking a breather. They'll need to take a lot more of a breather for me to get interested again. I think I have to look at the seasonality, but I think they bought them in the summer. So maybe around August when they're left for dead, that might be the time to buy it for the next three years. Um here is communication services. Remember in December, we're like discretionary communication services, ladies and gentlemen, and now it's starting to outperform. This is going to work a lot higher. Uh, energy, everyone wanted at the end of the year, and it's been the worst performer this year. It hasn't gotten cheap enough for us yet. Um, it, it will. Some of the gas stocks we would add more potentially, but uh, not in love yet. Um, Financials, we talked about already. There's some opportunity there. Industrials, we have our exposure through uh, 3M. Um, and a couple of other new ones, which we're not going to discuss. Um, tech, as I said, breaking out there. Staples, you know, no, no. Uh, utilities, yeah, not really interested. Healthcare, we're going to do through biotech, which we're going to look at. We, we, we're in biotech, and, and that's a nice weight for us. Uh, consumer discretionary, just getting going. I think there's huge opportunity there with people so pessimistic. Uh, that's the exploration production, not interested. Uh, retail, there might be something to do here. This has gotten beaten down enough. I uh, can look at some of those. All right, so here's the sectors. Again, real estate. Uh, KWeb, China Internet ETF is putting in this bottom. Fake breakout, take them out. We've covered this many times. We're going to cover it in the article in the week. Uh, biotech, again, like we said, the May started to outperform. Pull back to shake people out, and now it's coming out. This is uh, relative to the S&P 500 performance. We think this has huge, huge, huge upside. Um, uh, communication services. Yeah, and so on and so forth. This is just a shorter term chart to give you a different perspective. All right, moving right along. Here's the XBI because it's had a huge jump today and it's starting to finally work. You can see that uh, 30 or so of the components. When you look under the hood, there are a lot of good things happening. Here's AbV. Looks like it's going to do a long-term breakout, quote-unquote, cuff and handle for all the breakout. People are going to love this. Um, same thing with Alchemy. So these things are working. Amgen. Start, you know, was on the mat a couple of weeks ago when we talked about it on TV. It's starting to move. Um, so, so all these 30 components are really starting to work, which means I think we're going to finally see a breakthrough now that the tightening cycle is basically done. Biomarin, they're all coming up off the mat. Um, even the lower quality ones are starting to get a bid. You're just seeing it all over the place. So it's finally kind of teed up here to, to work and work in a nice way which is really positive to see uh, that's insight uh, ionis they're all coming off the mat and starting to, to rip rip higher which is exciting uh, what's this one moderna hmm all right uh nbix 
same story across the board for the most part. Regeneron broke out. Let's see if it follows through. Uh, CGen got bought for $42 billion, just the beginning, that, which is a core part of the, our two-pronged thesis, deals and drugs, $42 billion deal. You're going to see a lot more of that. Fi, uh, pharma, big Pharma has all the cash. They have no inno innovation. They have the patent cliffs, half a trillion dollars of cash, uh, most in, you know, grown 20-fold in a couple, in a five-fold, 400% increase in cash in the last 20 years. Now they got to put it to work to keep the growth game going and uh, Pfizer's, you know, doing it. All the other boards have been put on notice. We're going to see more of that. And that's why these stocks are starting to bid since that deal. And you're going to start to see more and more drugs. And it's going to be off to the races. Here's from Lauren Strauss. This is what make Bar makes Barron's the best financial publication in the world. He says, REITs are battered. It could be the time to nibble on a few. So he's not all in, but they're ahead of the curve. They're willing to step out. That's what makes them great. And that's why that's my favorite financial publication. Uh, the coming commercial real estate crash that may never happen. This is from Tim Mullaney over at CNBC, worth a read. Basically, this is the same as every single cycle they're going to extend and pretend. So everyone's saying, oh, all these things are maturing in, you know, 12 to, 12 to 48 months, one and a half trillion dollars. The world is going to end grow up. We do this every single cycle from the SNL crisis to 2008, 2009. We're going to do it again. Banks don't want to take all these properties on their balance sheet at a 40% discount. Oh, and by the way, the, 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 the bare narrative for commercial real estate uh, is that uh, prices are going to, between interest rates, cap rates, refinancing risk, uh, and, and vacancies, uh, these properties are going to all drop 40% in value. Well, guess what? Vornado's already trading at a 60 at a 40% discount to book. So the market's already priced in the worst case scenario. This reminds me so much of uh, uh, 2020 when we were pitching Wells Fargo and it took a few months to finally take off. And our thesis was that banks had to reserve for the worst case scenario under the accounting rules, current expected credit credit losses. If you were listening back then, you remember the word Cecil current ex expected credit loss, which basically means they reserved on the basis that there would be 20% unemployment and the world was ending and they reserved billions of dollars. And our thesis was they were over reserved and all of that, all of those reserves are going to come back as earnings in coming quarters. And sure enough, they, they did. And the only other, the only uh, journalist who got this right uh, after we started publishing was Carlton English over at Barron's. And it was surprising, you know, we were on CNBC Europe, uh, July, you can look it up under the YouTube channel, just scroll down to July of 2020 when we were talking about this. Uh, she was the only journalist who published about this after after that, and she was the only one who was right, and she doesn't get enough credit for that because that took a lot of courage to step out, and she was spot on, and uh, the whole group just completely took off. Um, okay, uh, Argus adds Intel stock to its focus list, sees it as a deep value opportunity, so Opinion follows trend. They're jumping on the bandwagon after the Bernstein guy did it last week. Uh, most of Wall Street is panicking about commercial real estate, but Goldman Sachs says there's little chance it triggers a financial crisis. Um, if the banks take the properties back and they don't extend the loans, they've got to take massive hits to their balance sheet. Uh, and... Um, they, they just can't do it from an equity standpoint. So that's why we're going to see extended and pretend. There'll be some volatility. There'll be some problems. You'll have the lower quality B and C properties, you know, have a big problem or get converted into condos or whatever it's going to be. But the fact of the matter is another point of unemployment and everyone's going to be back at the offices and not uh, by demand of their employer, by by fear of getting axed. And the easiest people to ax are the work, work from home people. They just say, they just shut off their access to the server and say, you know, uh, thank you, but we're uh, right sizing or whatever they say. And uh, it's been nice to have this service. The people you're working with eyeball to eyeball, you're not going to, you know, it's tougher to fire them. I mean, if they have to, they, they do it, but um, that's going to be easy. So what does that mean? It means that more and more people are going to be going back to the offices very, very quickly. Um, and it's already happening, by the way. 3M and five other stocks that could be spin-off plays. This is from Al Root. This is another thing that makes Barron's great. And he talks about the Alibaba spins to unlock value. He talks about 3M, which we've been talking about, which is a holding, both are holdings of ours. 
uh, and some other companies that are doing uh, tax free spins, which are going to be great for the company. Uh, Fed officials signal divide over whether to hike rates again. Uh, John Williams wants one. Goolsby says prudence and patience. God bless Goolsby coming on this year. That's very, very important. Uh, moving along, Amazon CEO Andy Jassy says really good AI models take billions of dollars to train. Uh, and they're launching generative artificial intelligence. He's also saying he'll get his expenses under control. We own Amazon. We think that's going to continue to work higher, and that'll be a double over the next few years as well. Uh, Andy Jassy says in the shareholder letter he's confident he can get uh, costs under control, so you can read that letter tonight. New car prices are falling. It's time to start haggling. This is from Al Root. This was part of our central thesis. The supply is now coming back. Deals in, and incentives are going to come out. 13 point, 13 and a half years average car on the road. This helps uh, Cooper Standard because they get paid for production volume and uh, and it's happening more and more. So this is a good thing. They're going to compete now aggressively with used cars and used cars can't compete because there's no reasonable financing available for used cars. For new cars, the dealer incentives are amazing. You see anywhere from 0% APR now up to 3.5% APR in a 7% environment. Uh, it's a home run. There's nothing to think about. Now that prices back off 5%, you're going to see people flocking. There's no question about it. The pent-up demand is there, and uh, and it'll be met by the supply now that the supply chain is all uh, worked out. Warren Buffett says more banks may fail, but he's willing to bet a million dollars that depositors won't lose money. Uh, that's fine. China exports unexpectedly jump in March. EV makers charge on as BI, BYD, NEO, stock surge. This was huge overnight. Um, uh, China exports surged in March, scrapping, uh, snapping five months of declines. Country sales abroad increased 14.8% from year earlier, defying expectations for another drop. That's a big spread from a drop to 14.8 plus, And it's just the beginning for China's recovery. You know, it's, it's amazing. Everyone's like, oh, China's recovery is slow. They've been open for, for 12 weeks. I mean, they, they haven't even figured out how to find the coffee maker in the office again. And, and everyone's saying it's not happening fast enough. I mean, you know, you don't take the second largest economy in the world uh, from a standstill, uh, from being dead back to life in two weeks. Uh, you know, this stuff has to now circulate through the system. And then once it goes, it's not going to be linear. It's going to be log, you know, uh, logarithmic. It's going to be straight up and parabolic moving forward. And I think the 5% estimates are actually very conservative. Wholesale inflation post biggest drop since the start of the pandemic. That was the PPI this morning. I don't know why this thing keeps logging me out. Anyway, uh, moving along. Ugh, here we go again, another one logging me out. Not much of a typer, but uh, let's see here. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> it would be like it's like I'm, you know, breaking into a bank here. The amount of security they have for me to log into my own account. What am I going to take out of a Bloomberg account? All right, here we go. Fed leans towards another hike, defying staff's uh, recession outlook. So this is the kind of back and forth that you saw last week that created all the problem. Good news for Alibaba and other Chinese stocks. UBS th sees three reasons to be bullish. Um, which is exciting from a European bank. UBS tends to be the most uh, positive of all the European banks and the highest quality. Um, he says, this is from Mark Heffley from Chief Investment Officer, UBS Global Wealth Management. China-U.S. tensions will likely continue to be a risk factor to performance, but we believe that the fundamental economic recovery should drive up another leg in the market. We therefore view Chinese equities as the most preferred in our global strategy. Uh, China's internet companies have been delivering positive earnings surprises with better than expected profits boosted as the country opens up after a series of economically destructive COVID-19 lockdowns last year. Ch China's tough regulators who ushered in a two-year route in Alibaba and other stocks also appeared to be easing up with multiple signs in the recent months that Beijing has been warming back up to tech. Uh, beyond tech, the consumer services sector is also being buoyed by China's reopening, UBS said with the sector seeing the earliest and strongest recovery trend among all consumption categories, such momentum is likely to be maintained over the next few quarters, in our view, with potential earnings revision from Q2, upside earnings revision from Q2-23. Uh, 
Even the property sector has seen improving sales outlook on the back of a 30% jump in sales year over year in March. Uh, and we continue to favor reopening opportunities within China equities and forecast an overall earnings growth of 14% this year. This is a big deal. Overall earnings growth of 14% this year. While everyone is struggling over, oh, will earnings be 200 or 220 in 2023? No one cares about 2023. Let's focus on 2024. But China uh, is the only country in the world right now that has growing money supply at a huge clip, teens, mid-teens money supply growth, while the rest of the world is contracting. Earnings growth is through the ceiling, 14%, and it's just the beginning. So uh, sell me more of your stock every time you get a 3% pullback. We're happy to take it in. Young people in greater China are blowing their paychecks every month, even if they don't have to. I love that. Look at that. They're buying stuff again. And if you're buying stuff in China, uh, you're going through my favorite toll taker called Alibaba, uh, which has uh, a huge share, which we covered last year in terms of the e-commerce business, I think about 50%. Uh, and that's going to continue. And the game is just beginning. They're slowly getting their confidence back. It's going to keep coming and it's going to come in a, in a major, major way. Uh, motorcycle. Okay. So I got to do these captures for every single page. Very excited about that fire hydrants here we go okay all right china bets 1.8 trillion dollars of construction will boost the economy so not only did they pump all that stuff in for consumption last year but now they're saying let's do more okay they're going back to their old playbook which is work during every single crisis Let's go back to construction and infrastructure. They're going to do $1.8 trillion worth, and that trickles through the entire economy, and that's a good thing for all of China, and, and the game is just getting started. So um, more good news on that front. Article of the week, snatch, snatching defeat and stock market and sentiment results. Uh, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. On Wednesday, the market started up nicely on the back of better than expected CPI prints. You can see this is completely collapsing. Uh, expectations were it was at five percent down from six percent month on month was one tenth of one percent versus uh, last print was four tenths of one percent you can see pretty much every, every category rolled over utilities was down seven point one percent in March uh, fuel oil down four percent gasoline down four point six percent energy down three point five percent food at home down three tenths of one percent I think even eggs were down, used cars down negative uh, nine tenths of one percent, uh, and medical care services down five tenths. It didn't take long for the Fed to mess things up once again and snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. So as soon as you got that print, market was up. Then Barkin comes out, Richmond Fed president and says, ah, I put particular focus on core inflation and there's still more to do there. And then at 1 p.m., so the market crashed, then it rallied and they're like, oh my God, the market's going up again. So they, they parade out daily. Uh, who is, by the way, the overseer of the SVB bank, bank failure. She was the bank regulator. That happened under her nose after multiple warnings. She had this backward-looking insight. Uh, the strength of the U.S. economy and rising inflation indicate there's more work to be done on rate hikes. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. She got SVB. She's got First Republic on the ropes. She's got Pacific West Bank, bank Corp. And she still doesn't get it. But, you know, it is what it is. I guess we didn't cause enough portfolio impairment in the banks yet. So far, only one has failed in her region. If they push hard enough, they can kick First Republic and Pacific Bank, West Bank Corp off the cliff. Her region will lead the pack for failure. Uh, you would think she might be the cautious one moving forward, but I guess breaking things is an afterthought. Bureaucrats blame management and then taxpayers pick up the tab either through bailouts, which is a direct tax on the middle and upper class, or through inflation, which is an indirect tax on the poor. Finally, at 2.30, we got the Fed whisperer because what happened again, um, I guess I guess Daly couldn't bring it down enough, only two ticks. So they had to bring out Timoreos at 2.30 to completely crash the market into the close where he came out and said, Fed may keep interest rate uh, uh, hike on the table uh, for the next meeting. And that was enough. So Buffett was out in the morning suggesting more banks will fail, but the depositors would be protected. Uh, note, he is not invested in any of the quote-unquote cheap regional banks of yet. He only owns Bank of America. And the thing that is so perplexing about Chairman Powell is that while he has repeatedly stated that he aspires to be like Paul Volcker, 
quote, keep at it, it is apparent that he does not understand the history. Maybe he hasn't even read the book. Because in 1982, while inflation was still above 6%, Volcker cut the Fed's funds rate by 2% in July of 1982. He, he not only stopped cutting, hiking, he cut. So here's what happened. Inflation was 7.1% in June, and then July meeting, 6.4%. He cuts the Fed funds rate by 2%. And uh, you see here 200 basis points, from 15% Fed funds to 13%, and we're off to the races, and then he continues to cut into the end of the year. Here's what happened next. The market initially had a little rally, faked out, and then it rallied 64% from the July lows over the next 12 months. 64% rally once he changed tactics. So that's a big deal. Ah, but you say, what about inflation, you ask? It must have come back and exploded higher with animal spirits back in the markets. You had 65% rally. I'm sure people were buying more milk and eggs and all the things uh, and, and paying higher rents. Well, try again. Inflation collapsed to 2.5% due to the lagged effect of tightening that he had done over the previous 12 to 18 months. Volcker knew this would happen because he studied, understood, and respected history. He wasn't looking at data points on a monthly basis with backward looking data saying, you know, I'm not doing anything until it hits 2%. Let me tell you something. If you get to plus 2%, before you stop hiking, you're going to be at negative 2% before you know it. You're, and deflation is a much harder problem to solve than dealing with inflation. Pause, wait. If you got to raise again, you raise again. Or you can manage it through the balance sheet, like which we've been saying for nine months now, uh, and sell off a couple hundred billion dollars of bonds if you want to control liquidity and leave rates where they are. So um, here is the inflation rate one year later after he did his first cut was at 2.5. And for everyone saying, oh, if they start cutting, that's going to be really, really bad for the economy and the market. That's because you're stuck in recency bias of 2000, 2000 and 2008. If you look back, there are many instances where they stopped hiking and the market roared higher. And it even in many cases, cut and the market roared higher. And, and 1982 was one of those perfect examples. So far, it is not clear that Powell understands this concept. I'm rooting for him to prove me wrong. He seems like a nice guy. He's a successful business guy. He's a quality guy. I don't know that he's the perfect fit for this job, but hopefully he burdens himself with the facts and makes the right decisions moving forward, and he's going to come out as a monster hero and go out down in the history books like Volcker, but he's right on the edge here, and he, if he pushes over, he's going to be another Arthur Burns in the opposite way, just like he almost was with the autopilot if Mnuchin didn't bail him out in December 2018. So I'm rooting for him to prove me wrong and pause in time, just like his hero did in 1982. He has a chance to be another hero, but he's cutting it very cl close to the point of no return. Things are already breaking and the Fed is tone deaf. So why was Alibaba down on Wednesday? The first, this was the most common question of the day. Here's the answer. And by the way, it rebounded a bit today. So there you go. Two reasons. Number one, the entire group led by Tencent, which was down the most, was down for this reason. Um... Process, which is a European company that owns a lot of Tencent stock, unveiled a plan to sell another 96 million shares worth about $4.4 billion to fund its stock buyback, which is basically to fund their other low quality, lackluster businesses. They're selling, they're cutting their flowers to water their weeds, uh, which is the exact wrong thing. SoftBank is doing the exact same thing, which we're going to cover in a second. So, um, so that was that. And then SoftBank needs more liquidity from their sales of failed in, series of failed investments, more cutting their flowers and watering their weeds. They've been selling for about six months down in the hole, so not real news. Looks like their last tranche just selling out of it finally. No other liquidity. And by the way, good riddance. They've been a they've been a overhead supply on the stock for you know a year now. Happy to get rid of them. They have no other liquidity as their arm high, uh, arm holdings IPO. It's not the right time to do that, so they have to sell their their diamonds to pay for their, you know, pieces of coal uh, in their portfolio. So um, they have no other liquidity as most of their portfolios in venture capital and cash, cash flow negative tech. Good luck raising money for cash flow negative businesses right now. They have no choice. As a remain, it's, it, Alibaba is their only quality business they can sell. As a reminder from two weeks ago's article, we are in a, 
aversion period headed up to denial. Uh, could we fill the gap at 86 again first? Possible, but not probable. This is where we were yesterday. I think we closed up a couple bucks today. Since we've covered the fundamentals many times over, here are our first technical targets, which are miles away from our final targets. 160 is on the basis of filling a gap. Covered this two weeks ago, by the way, which is 180 is on the basis of a measured move from the inverse head and shoulders, shoulder, head, shoulder, and then the measured move is from here to here, which takes you up to 180. Uh, which is where a lot of overhead supply is. So that'll be another fake out. People will buy up after the huge move. They'll get washed out down to 140, and then they'll make the final move to uh, fair value. I would pay attention to the short-term overhead supply. Okay, so we covered that. While technical analysis is a tool, it's not the answer. It's simply a guide to understand where you might be in the process. We find sentiment and positioning slightly more helpful. Just in just this case, in this case, the technicals are lining up perfectly with the standard Emotional Process Cycle by Justin Mammis. We have covered this chart many times in the past. So you can see it's to the T, ladies and gentlemen. This is panic right here. This is discouragement right in October. This is anxiety when you ran back up to 120. This is aversion when you shot down to 80. This is denial when you move back up to 100. And now we pulled back to 93 which is right before you break out and then you go straight up and no one can catch you. Recency bias. There are a ton of charts out there that show us why a recession is upon us and therefore the stock market must crash. In most instances, they point to the last 20 years and show that because it happened in 2000 and 2008, it must always happen. When you step back and look at a longer timeline, the facts simply don't bear it out. Argument one, ISM manufacturing P&I hasn't been this low since 2008 and 2000. We're gonna crash. It was a lot lower in 1982, and we rallied 64% in the next 12 months. Why? Because the Fed cut rates. Most people are saying if the Fed cuts, we will crash because the Fed is too far behind the curve. Again, recency bias from 2008 and 2000. So here's the ISM. You look, it was even much lower uh, in 1982, and you got the monster rally. Argument two, the stock market must crash because the yield curve is inverted. See 1982 once again. You already had the first inversion. Then this is the second inversion. We're having the exact same situation right now. Market rallied in the face of that. Argument three, oil prices are not rallying despite the supply cut equals a recession. See 1982. Oil prices were rolling over and the market rallied. Argument four, market drawdown will be lower than October lows once the recession comes. The drawdown of 27% last year in the S&P 500 was bigger than the early 90s, the SNL crisis recession, and the same as the 1982 drawdown which you can see all the way back here. Uh, and finally, the auto supplier update uh, with Cooper Standard. One of our top positions is auto supplier Cooper Standard. We made our case for the stock on the podcast video cast in May, as well as on Fox Business on June 7th with Liz Clayman, and executed across accounts at around 550. It's now up 137% as of yesterday's close, I think a little more today. You can see the original clip here. Cooper Standard thesis remains intact as new auto sales continue to see, exceed expectations. Here's the data from Morgan Stanley. Thanks to my buddy Zach for sending me all that stuff all the time. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, thank you to Adam for sending me all this stuff from Merrill. Uh, very grateful for that. So you can see the numbers continue to grow. They, tro they troughed on a global basis at 73 million. They're going to do 80 million this year, back up to 85 million. Uh, right in the neighborhood of 2017, 2018. And that's when we believe the company can earn six to eight bucks a share. Uh, and uh, you put a trough multiple, you got a 60 to $80 stock. You put a peak multiple, you're, you're back in triple digits, which would be unbelievable. Uh, you know, <laughs> very nice. So, <laughs> very nice. Uh, so we take it, take it quarter by quarter here. But uh, U.S. Ford Motor Company sales jumped 10% in first quarter of 2023. You wouldn't know that if you were listening to all the analysts on TV bashing the stocks. General Motors sales jumped 18% in the first quarter. You wouldn't know that by all the pessimism. And then here's something from um, I think George or Frank. Uh, I think George. I'll get it right, but. Whoever sent this, you know who you are. Thanks for sending it over. Maybe I'll find it in the Ask Me Anything questions. GM breaks production record at Arlington, Texas assembly plant. Had their highest ever production in that particular plant. So that's a nice anecdote. 
Uh, retail people are scared again. That's why the market's uh, up. Uh, fear and greed is a little better than neutral, so sentiment's improving. And we talked about the National Association of Active Investment Managers. They're at 60%. They're going to have to chase up if we get anything better than massively pessimistic earnings. Uh, more institutions buying Alibaba options. This was December 2023, 160s, 6,000 contracts, which is enough to control about uh, uh, six, $60 million of stock, give or take, um, at $160 by December. So that that's, you know, that's not grandma next door again. Uh, earnings, the top 30 weights in the Dow Jones Industrial over the last 60 days, uh, revised down by 1% for 2023. And for 2024, uh, you got to fix this, it's down 37 basis points. So basically flat over the last 60 days, despite the choppiness in the market. NASDAQ, on the other hand, guess what? Earnings were revised up. Who's covering this? No one. So top 30 weights, cumulative earnings power, revised up by 2.15% for 2023, revised up 1.87% for 2024. Remember, no one wanted to give away tech? Well, guess what's working? There you go. Uh, some economic data here. China's money supply up 12% uh, year on year for the month of March. That's what we were talking about, M2 money supply. Uh, they have no inflation, so they can stimulate to the cows come home. Basically, it was... Uh, down for PPI, modestly up for CPI, and month-on-month -month negative for CPI. So that's good to see. That gives them a lot of runway. Um, we w already went through our main numbers with regards to inflation. Jobless claims were higher than last week even at 240,000. So the Fed's getting what they want. They better be careful they don't get too much of they want. Initial jobless claims, 239,000. Oh, that was the four-week average, 240,000. This week was 239,000 versus 228 versus 232 estimates. So, um, you know, declare victory and go home. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Keep rates elevated for the time being. PPI was actually negative month on month, 3.4% uh, year on year. And continuing jobless claims was, was uh, also somewhat elevated. So that's that. Uh, earnings for next year stay up around 247.95. Uh, that's mind-boggling, uh, and the market's going to start to discount that, even if they come down to 40. Uh, and moving on to the Ask Me Anything questions. Henry Gill, uh, what's your opinion of China Automotive Systems, CAAS? Let's take a look at this. Uh, stock has done nothing. Let's just see. This is usually the sign of a low-quality business, a stock that's done nothing for 20 years. But let's see if anything's improving in terms of the fundamentals. Uh, but usually that's a sign of, a, of a, a cancer in management where they don't respect the stock. They're not there to work for the shareholders. Either they're giving themselves too much cash or stock or some shenanigans are going on that, the, that it's not getting anywhere for that long a period of time. So that, that's a huge red flag. I'll just quickly go through it. I, I mean, for me, it's probably a, a pass, even before looking at the data. All right, revenues are growing. Margins are declining. Free cash flow looks okay. Let's look at here. CAS. Automotive components in China. All right, so revenues have basically been flat since 2017. Making about 69 cents a share. Cash flow. Free cash flow has been flat. I'm sorry, that's cash from operations. Free cash flow. Uh, free cash flow margins are single digit. Uh, 
Yeah, this is a low quality business. I wouldn't touch it. Um, I would not touch it. And it's low quality, and, and you don't want low quality in China because you got like a coin flip odds of being a, a fraud. So um, that's that. Let's move move forward. Uh, Dan Spellacy. After paying off my student loans last year, I started looking into investing. When I first found your podcast, I didn't understand half of what you were saying, but I found myself coming back every week anyway, and I've gotten a lot of value. I noticed you use a lot of value investing terms and ideas in the podcast, but your investing style seems to be more aggressive than traditional value investing than I've seen it described elsewhere. Can you describe how your investing style differs from traditional value investing? Also, does running an investment firm change the way you invest? Would you make all the same moves if you were acting as an individual? Um, okay. How does my style differ? I look for quality businesses that generate a higher return on invested capital than I can generate, uh, or at least in line with what I can generate. And they've been dislocated. So high quality businesses that are marked down so that even if they're only compounding capital at 10 or 20%, based on where I'm buying it down 30, 40, 50, 60%, um, the price catching up to that compounding of capital can be two, three bagger over a reasonable amount of time, 24, 36 months. So uh, I think the difference between what I do and what uh, the traditional value investors, they, they buy cheap for cheap for cheap sake. I buy quality businesses when they're marked down and quality businesses have the ability to consistently compound capital, have predictable cash flows. Uh, and that's, that's the core uh, difference. I don't, um, uh, so I, I don't tend to get caught in value traps. Um, can you describe your, okay, so we covered that. Does running an investment firm change the way you invest? No, I invest my money alongside my clients. Uh, would you make all the same moves uh, acting as an individual? I, my, I eat my own cooking. So uh, I do, I put my money where I put my clients' money and, um, and that's that. And, you know, if there's some super small speculative uh, punt uh, I'll do from time to time. I wouldn't do because you have a risk of loss of capital. But you know, by and large, I'm in the businesses that I want to be in with the clients. And then how we get additional returns from high quality compounders is we'll have a small portion of the po portfolio that expresses it with long dated premium. So um, what might be a double turns into two or three X over two to three years, uh, provided that the option pricing is attractive uh, over over the long duration. So that hope that helps. Matt Mitchell, I hope things are well. Getting some time to dial in the swing for the summer. We are. Was wondering if you could take a quick look at Shim, Shimano, a Japanese multinational manufacturing company that makes bike components, fishing tackle, and rowing equipment. Seems like it's trading quite cheap. Highly profitable business with wide moat, almost no debt, and boatload of cash. Consistent free let cash flow. I got to tell you, uh, I know Buffett's doing all these Japanese trading companies and he's winning in the short term. I don't think it's going to work. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I've just seen it over and over with very smart people that get seduced by it. It's getting better uh, in Japan. But the fact is they have the same problem and they haven't solved it, which is population decline. And um, they also are not enormous fans of shareholder value. So a lot of these Japanese country companies are family controlled and their number one interest is not the international investor. Their number one interest is not going out of business. So they're not because they it's about saving face and you know unlike entrepreneurial America where um, if you fail you get up and you do it again. Uh, in Japan, if you fail, you fall on your sword and, you know, game over. Um, so they're unwilling to take any type of risk on lock value. Um, and, and, and that's why oftentimes you don't see the value realized in these quote unquote cheap companies in Japan. So for me, I generally stay away from Japanese companies. But um, let's take a look here. S. Um, and, and why? Because they're going to look perfect and then they're never going to do anything. The, the, this is where a traditional value investor gets caught in the value traps is uh, Japan, where money goes to die. So let's see. Yeah, everything looks great. This thing should work. But it's Japan, so 
Um, it's not a guarantee. Yeah, I mean, this thing looks great. Uh, base PPS. Cash flow. I mean, there's nothing not to like from the original look other than the fact that um, you got to see who else owns it. Is it a family business? Is it is it controlled by a family? What are the incentives of management? I mean, I think you could take a pun here and probably be fine. Uh, and yeah, I I don't. There's nothing wrong with your analysis in a general sense. It's just when it comes to Japan. Just from my experience, I've seen very smart people go there and they just evaporate capital and they just sit there and sit there and sit there and it never works. Um, maybe this time will be different with the blessing from Buffett and you'll start to see more international flows go into Japan. Um, um, you know, it looks okay. Just just really do a lot of work. See who owns it. See, look for the bear case and then size it accordingly because you, you can be right and this thing could be at $20 for the next four years. And that's the sad part about it. Although sooner or later, the, the you know the, the the price should catch up to the fundamentals i've just seen many instances in japan where it just never does for some reason uh okay by the way this was paul falcone who sent that uh thing about the arlington factory so thanks paul uh david austin really appreciate the work you put into the podcast wanted to get your thoughts on o'reilly auto parts seems to me that o'reilly and AutoZone are analogous to uber and lyft two large-scale players with low risk of going out of business I don't know if I'd say that about Uber and Lyft, but um, or Lyft, but anyway, I, I kind of agree with that. And I'm curious your take on the fundamentals. O'Reilly's up 21% over the last six months. Wondering if you think there's still upward potential. Thanks again. Um, all right, so I wouldn't buy O'Reilly. I mean, it's it's a fantastic business, um, but it's had a huge move. Um, it's going to continue to perform, but I think it's going to underperform relative to some other opportunities. And they, you know, they're buying back stock. They're doing all the right things, but it's it's had the move. Uh, what I do like in the space, if if you put a gun to my head and said buy a reseller of auto parts, uh, I'd probably look at uh, advanced auto parts before I looked at O'Reilly. At least you got some upside here uh, to kind of a reversion trade, and you've got a decent business um you know you have a big compounder of capital here let's see what o'reilly does i mean o'reilly is a great compounder as well which is why the stock's done nothing but up but i think uh over the next 12 to 24 months you're going to get more bang for your buck in uh advanced auto parts and they're a compounder of capital they've been beaten down in the short term probably due to supply chain uh, what is the excuse here? Supply and manufacturing center. Uh, inventory is priced in U.S. dollars. Recent strength of the greenback. So this is a currency play, which I which I'm I like uh, the dollar weakening play. So I, I think there's there's just more bang for your buck in advanced auto parts. I'm not going to go through the whole analysis, but I did take a look at both of them. Uh, Yuval, Tom, loved your podcast, shared it with a lot of people. Thank you for that. Interested in your opinion on Matriarch. Looks like a great stock. What do you think? So Yuval, one of the key things that I like to do during periods of dislocation is buy the highest quality. I mean, Matriarch is probably the lowest quality and it'll, it'll work. Um, but it, well, let me not say that it might work, but I think the risk is just too high given the dislocation in, in the REIT sector to be dealing with a second or third tier player. I mean, if you're right, you make a five bagger. If you're wrong, you get zero. I don't like those odds. I'd rather deal with something that's more of a sure thing that's gonna be up 200 some odd percent, pay me to wait. Uh, and it's businesses that I would wanna own whether I own, or, or assets that I would wanna own whether I own this you know public stock or not. Um, I 
anyway, I don't know. Uh, so I, I would just, I would go higher up the food chain. I think, I mean, let me just take a look at the, well, this is all about the assets of Matriarch and their second tier assets. So I'm going to just say pass because it's not the highest quality. JT Investor, Tom, can you share any insight on how the mechanics will work for shareholders of BABA's ADRs and Hong Kong shares once the breakup of the various entities is executed? Will there be multiple ADRs in the new Hong Kong shares that trade under distinct ticker symbols for various entities? If this is the case, are there any actions shareholders will need to take to make sure they continue to participate as shareholders in the various entities? Thanks again for your thoughts and have a good weekend. Well, they said in the press release, number one, we don't know because we don't know which businesses are going to be spun. Number two, they said explicitly it won't affect the ADRs. So um, what, however they extract the value, whether it's a spin co or it's a new IPO, whether you own, if you own in Hong Kong, you'll probably get the Hong Kong equivalent. If you own in the U.S., you'll probably get the U.S. equivalent. If you own the U.S., maybe you'll get the Hong Kong equivalent, but more likely than not, you'll get a uh, over-the-counter stock uh, like, like you're looking at right here with Shimano, this Japanese company. Uh, which trades over the counter in the U.S. So it, it'll be perfectly fine uh, either way. So with that said, I think we got through all the questions. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We're going to be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.